So um, this, uh, this talk's really about the application of ultra-thin reflective surface films to the very surface of the ocean to try and shade corals uh, from direct sunlight, or partially shade them and to protect them from coral bleaching. So it's very much a multidisciplinary project. It's been a lot of fun to work on so far, um, but we're still quite early days, so it's not a huge amount of data. So I've been working with colleagues from Melbourne University and Deakin University who have been developing these ultra-thin films. Um, we've been applying them and looking at their behaviour in the National Sea Simulator at Ames. And we're just starting to feed some of the data from these results um, into the eRefs project uh, through Mark. And you heard from Mark this morning with his great talk on how but look, the interactions between light and temperature and how that results in bleaching. So how does shading um, reduce bleaching? Um, well, bleaching is caused primarily, as you heard this morning, by thermal stress, um, but it's strongly influenced by solar radiation as well. And if we look at solar radiation, we can break it down into three parts. I'll do that because each type of solar radiation can affect bleaching in different ways. So you've got the very high energy UV, um, which makes it down to some of the shallow corals. And this is directly harmful to corals under certain circumstances, especially when um, you've got really hot water as well. You've got the, um, the visible range of sunlight, and we heard this morning that if you have really hot days where there's a lot of sunlight, this uh, production, uh, well, the photosynthesis essentially goes into overdrive, and you get an overproduction of reactive oxygen species. And this really enhances coral bleaching. And over on the left hand side, you've got the infrared light. Um, it's not as energetic, but there's a lot of it, and it contributes to around half the water <coughs> of the ocean as well. So, if you have a, an intervention which can shade across all of those parts of the spectrum, then, then you've got multiple ways that you might be able to reduce bleaching. So, in fact, there has been a number of studies over the years that have shown in the field that corals that are shaded often bleach less. So if you're a coral and part of you is self-shaded, or if you're a coral and you're shaded by your neighbour, often you will be less bleached than the corals that are in direct sunlight. Um, it depends on a whole range of other things as well, but that's one factor. There's also been a number of studies which have shown that neutral shade cloth in experimental tanks uh, and even in the field is really also effective at reducing bleaching but it's quite a cumbersome technique. So uh, an experiment like that was run and, and published last year, but I and it was not a quite a nice paper. And one of the things that came out of it, I thought, was this really great quote that puts this kind of intervention into context. And it says, shading is unique in that it is a potential direct intervention that can reduce bleaching in response to a specific forecast of a coming event. When I read that, uh, it means to me that if we can, if we're forecasting that bleaching is coming, and we've got a really agile uh, and flexible response, where well, we can get in place quickly, maybe we can do something on local scale. Oops, I've gone too far. So, um, shading by thin films. This uh, this diagram attempts to show you what, how it works. Uh, it's pretty simple. On the right hand side of the diagram, you've got a reflective film just at the very surface of the water and it's reflecting and scattering some of the light and therefore shading the corals underneath. So we've been working with ultra-thin films which are comprised of two components. So the first component is a thin film forming component. When I say ultra-thin, it's one molecule thick. That's it. The second component is calcium carbonate. It's pretty simple. It's white. It reflects. It reflects light across the spectrum and um, we're using very small particles. The job of the ultra-thin film forming component is to actually just keep that carbonate at the very surface of the water. So I can't tell you exactly what the thin film forming component is, a bit of a trade secret just yet, we need to do a little bit more work on it. Um, but we're, we're looking at the moment at a material that's already pleasant, present in the marine environment, it's present in virtually all life. It's uh, very low toxicity, breaks down very rapidly as well. I think it's extremely safe. And obviously calcium carbonate is a material that makes up coral skeletons. So it's safe in the marine environment as well. Especially at the concentrations or the amounts that we're actually using. So, how much do we actually need to use? So, the calcium carbonate 
component, if we want to shave an entire hectare of reef, it's about a buck, like half a bucket full of calcium carbonate, 10 kilos, which is not a huge amount. I think what's impressive about um, the, the thin films, they can only actually need 10 grams per hectare, like less than a tablespoon, to keep that calcium carbonate at the surface in the formulation. So that's pretty cool. Um, because when we don't use so, you know, we're only using a very small amount of material, the materials are very common, it's actually really cheap. So we're talking up to 50, for the materials alone, it's around $50 per hectare for protection. Um, we don't need to put in infrastructure into the marine environment, although you could put in automatic dispensers um, near a reef or you could put in bundles, which could be quite, quite, you know, at quite a bit of cost in the process. Um, one of the advantages that I see of the project is, or of this approach is that it's, uh, it's, mod it's, it's portable, it's really flexible, you only need to apply it at very short notice when you predict a, full, a, a bleaching is going to happen. Um, and also it's temporary, it's not there in the long term like shade cloth might be. There might be negative effects from too much shading over time but you wouldn't have that with this particular approach. So when I show it, so it's temporary and degrades, what will happen is it will move off the reef. That will very much depend on uh, the reef and the wind conditions uh, and the currents at the time. We heard from Mark this morning about water retention on reefs. It's not going to be suitable um, on reefs without being constrained um, if the water movement's really strong across that reef. But in some situations it might be, and if we're able to constrain it, then, then that's a possibility as well. So when it moves off the reef, um, You'll actually see in the next few slides that this material actually self-assembles. But if the wave action gets too high, it breaks apart and won't self-assemble. At that point, the calcium carbonate will drop out and add an insignificant amount of uh, a very natural material to the sea floor, and the film forming component will degrade really quickly within days to weeks. So this is what it looks like um, from underneath in the uh, National Sea Simulator in one of the, in one of the medium tanks. Um, we, th we used to think these were big tanks, but the tanks over there are getting bigger and bigger. This is a few metres across. Um, here you can see uh, iceberg type structures. That only really forms when you don't have a current, so it's, it's not normal, but it's, it's quite a good photo. All you can see there is a calcium carbonate thin film. It's only a molecule thing you can't see. It So this is supposed to start automatically, and it's supposed to be a movie, there it is. So I just wanted to show you what, how we've been adding it to the tank so far. Uh, we've simply been spraying it on, so Florida is just using a standard household sprayer to apply it in droplet form. You can um, potentially apply it in a powder as well, or you could drop it on because it self-assembles. And when you look at it from underneath, you can start to see how it self-assembles there. We haven't got a current in that tank at the moment, um, and it actually assembles much better if you have a current or you have some water movement and some small, you know, very small waves. And here you can see that it's sort of self-assembling. We haven't added much material to that tank. We wanted to show what the corals look like um, without the film, with the film. So we've also done a very small-scale experiment in, in the cesium. Um, in this experiment, we took a range of coral species through an artificial bleaching. We took them up to 31 degrees for a couple of weeks. And over half the corals we had the film and the other ones were unshaded. And here we were just using um, uh, visible sunlight so there was no infrared, no UV in this, in this experiment. And you can see that across the bottom we have corals that had the film on them. Ones across the top, typical of corals that had no film. So there was moderate protection from bleaching even though we're only shading by around 18%. So this was a prototype film, and so we hope or we expect we'll be able to get the shading up to around 30%. Um, and if we get up to 30%, we'll hopefully we'll be able to make a bigger difference, but these results are pretty promising. So just to recap, the very thin film focuses the carbonate at the surface, that's all it's there for. Um, we've got shading across the spectrum. Um, and also including the infrared, so maybe there might be a local effect of less heating, but we certainly need to, to look into that and model that. Um, we can apply it in a range of different ways because it self-assembles. Um, we haven't done experiments on gas exchange, but there are publications which have, 
which um, have assessed whether or not monolayers very similar to this um, prevent gas exchange in that day. So that's good. Um, there's certainly no barrier to animals. Uh, it takes no force at all to get through that um, film and it simply reforms afterwards and it's made of, of natural materials and uh, it's non-toxic. So the next stages, um, I've already mentioned we're starting to develop um, a formulation that should be able to shape by around 30%. So we need to test that. We'll be testing its behaviour in wind and wave action. We haven't done that yet. Uh, we'll initially do that in Melbourne in the facility they've got there, a wind wave generating tank. We need to start to test the retention. Um, David Mead put up a, an image of, a, um, of an oil spill boom going all the way around an island. Yeah, that's one option. Um, we need to think about that. Uh, also, and we'll be doing that in large tanks initially, and hopefully if we can get some permits, we'll do some very small scale um, field trials to see if it behaves in the field as we expect it to before scaling up. Um, certainly we need to, we've heard a lot about this this week, we need to explore the social and regulatory licence to apply this on a, on a very large scale. We'll do that through the RAP process, but that's one of the reasons why we're here. Um, talking about this type of intervention you know, so early in its development is to get feedback, so we'll welcome that. And what we'll be doing with the data, um, as I mentioned earlier, is feeding that into the E-Reef system, look at its feasibility on a much larger scale. So Mark stole our thunder a little bit here, um, but just to reiterate, um, the data that, go, that, that we've got um, <coughs> If we have shading by 30%, you can see that in the in you know down the bottom, we've got Davies Reef and it's the amount of light reaching the sea floor, and in the top we've got no shading. In the bottom we've got shading by 30%, and you can see that on a, on a, each scenario is a single day, and you can see over that period in the 2016 heating event, um, that we're getting quite a reduction in light at the sea floor. Now Mark mentioned that um, it's the light that's reaching the sea floor and also the temperature which combine to cause a reactive oxygen stress in the corals, which leads to bleaching. And so he's modelled that as well. Um, he's actually published something similar to this already this year. Published this model so that the information is out there on how it can be done. And here you can see that down the bottom where we have shading, we're expecting to get much less reactive oxygen stress and photosystem stress in the corals hopefully leading to less pollution. So obviously these are very early, very preliminary data. Um, they don't account for UV or potentially reduce heat. We need to think about that. At the moment the e reef model doesn't deal with surface films and how they move about. It's more about, it's much more about currents for instance as I, as, I, uh, as I understand it. So we need to get a lay into the e reef models to look at what might happen to the films under certain wind conditions so we know which reefs it may be applicable to and where we might apply it so that it moves over the reef over the hottest, sunniest part of the day. So um, just to finish up, um, this kind of intervention is definitely not for the whole reef. It's, however, it is scalable. So we think it can be scaled up to many hectares at least. And certainly just like all interventions, it's not going to help in the long run unless we have really serious interventions um, on climate change. Um, greenhouse gases. We think though that, as I've said before, it's agile, it's scalable to an extent and it's cheap and in some scenarios um, such as where we have very high value reefs, high ecological value reefs, uh, maybe they're reefs which see other reefs nearby or maybe it's a tourism site that, that needs to be looked after for an industry, um, it may be applicable at that scale. Uh, just like to thank Tiffany Co Foundation, Great Barrier Reef Foundation, thank you very much for uh, funding so far. We're trying to keep this uh, moving along with some funding from uh, the Queensland Government through Advanced Queensland as well. And we're feeding the information to the RAP, as I mentioned. So. Thank you.